Hi everyone, I'll stop saying guys from now on because according to YouTube analytics, nearly 10% of the channel audience are female. It's a bit of a shock to me or I had all the wrong partners in this life, but apparently there really are some women who are into digital room correction. Anyway, today's tutorial is a unique one. We'll create four different layers of digital FIR filters for your stereo system in a format that can be used in any DSP engine, including room, J River, mini DSP or totally free engines like equalizer APO. Filter one will be a tool base array, which I have tested to be highly efficient as a pre-filter to clean up the largest standing waves in the room. Filter 2 is a frequency response inversion over the target curve. These will be all done in the free tool Room EQ Wizard. Filter 3 is an optimized crossover phase correction filter which we'll create in another free tool Reface. The fourth and the last filter is a brand new one I have been working on for quite some time now and it will be for excess phase inversion for which we will additionally be using an Excel spreadsheet. Such a sophisticated correction with just free tools required a bit of manual work but I try to keep it as practical and compatible as possible. The subscribers among you will notice that I already have separate videos for each of the first three filters but this tutorial contains additional tips as well as optimizations on almost all of these. While the individual improvements in the overall sound by these filters are evolutionary in themselves the combined filter is more like revolutionary, hence the video title. This combination covers all known state-of-the-art digital correction steps in literature and to my knowledge most of the information is not publicly available anywhere. So if you dedicate the time to understand and carefully apply all the instructions, there's a high probability that your system will be sounding in a different league at the end. All filters are independent and can be used on their own or in any combination if required. Chapters will be indexed so you can easily skip to a certain filter you like to try. There will be download links in the description area for all the free software I'll be citing throughout the tutorial. I'll also provide a list of test tracks including their title links to inspect your results for pre and post ringing, overall bass response, center imaging, cohesion between your speakers and clipping. Remember to check them out. Lastly, I should remind you that correct speaker placement has no digital substitute. This technique will produce even better results if your speakers are positioned symmetrically in a four-sided room. Before we dive into the measurement process details, a quick reminder for you. This channel is only about freely available digital room correction and neither has any sponsors nor any monetary objective. It's all about sharing a wealth of otherwise inaccessible information for audiophiles. I don't upload videos on a regular basis and usually create tutorials erratically only after new discoveries or optimizations I come up with and the content is a bit too specialized and nowhere near close enough in volume to be ranked high in YouTube searches. This is AI dubbing for OCA. If you want to stay up to date, please do subscribe. Back to OCA. With that out of the way, now let's talk about some measurement requirements and metrics. 48,000 Hz sample rate. REW's default, which requires measurement frequency range between 0 Hz to 24,000 Hz. Use acoustic timing reference. My reference output speaker is right. You might choose left, just you can't change it during the measurements. Measurement length 1 million, not only gonna give you higher signal to noise ratio, but also kind of necessary for all the excess phase inversions and what have you throughout the process for smooth vector operations. This causes resulting convolution files to have too many taps and slows down the DSP engine, but there's a way to trim them down. 1 million is your best option because it's in fact 1,048,576 samples. Each measurement is gonna last for 22 seconds you will take the measurement level of each speaker minimum 70 db this already produces combined with the right speaker 76 db of spl the target curve is optimized for 75 the higher the better actually for signal to noise ratio but you have to adjust the target curve slope if it's extremely higher than this level you have to take a total of six measurements, one where your left ear is going to be when you're sitting at the central position, one where your right ear is going to be, actually two each for left and right speaker, and finally one at the exact precise central location, again for left and right speaker, or optionally also for left and right speaker together in the middle. The reason we take the precise central measurement last is to be able to keep the microphone there without moving throughout the rest of the process for testing and remeasuring purposes. I'm using my microphone vertically, pointing upwards. For this particular process, you can also use it pointing forward in horizontal position. Because the measurement points are too close to each other, it wouldn't make much difference. These microphones are capsules in front of them are very directional actually. With horizontal, although you lose some sensitivity, you make sure the sensitivity is the same for all measurements. When you point forward, you will lose a little bit of an angle, but it's really too small, so you're free. Just make sure you use the right calibration file or else your high frequency response will be inaccurate. 
And for the last measurement, to be precisely at central location, you can use accurate software's free trial version, for which you will find a link. It helps you very accurately align the microphone in exactly the middle of left and right speakers. Or you can do it manually, taking measurements, remeasuring every time in rows, overlays, impulse tap. Here, for example, the right speaker is the acoustic reference. The impulse peak is always in time zero, the green line. And the highlighted yellow red line is left speaker. When this is the result of the measurement it means left speaker is arriving earlier than the right so you have to move the microphone towards the right speaker and remeasure when they're on top of each other you're done obviously this takes a lot more time than this but both are equally efficient in calibrating your microphone placement and it doesn't really need to be perfect at the end of the day you move your head during listening to music but the closer the better now we can start creating our filters in the room eq wizard all right let's open rew I have saved the measurements exactly as described in this video. Six measurements. The name is zero and dot. Let's fit to fit data to screen. Left speaker measurement at microphone position left L lowercase L. Right speaker at microphone position left R L. And left speaker at microphone position right, which is right ear position, L R and R R. So and the middle positions L M and R M. I also additionally measured, which is not necessary, LRM, both speakers together at the middle position. I didn't have to measure LRM, I could just take LM and RM vector average and it will be the same except for the dB difference. Let's call that LRC for calculated LR and if you leave only the LR measurements in the screen, you will see that LRM is boosted by 6 dB. LRM. If you give it a minus 6 dB SPL offset, they are going to be right on top of each other, except for very small differences in the reflections in the high frequency area and the very low frequencies. It's because of the amplifier, probably. Add offset to data, so they are the same. It's just because double the speaker, double the sound pressure, and every 6 dB is doubling. That's why you don't even need to take measurements of left and right at the central position. But it's safe to do it, because if there is a major difference here, then you have to check the measurement for some problem. We start by cross-correlation, aligning speakers, different positions, measurements to each other. First, left speakers. Select LL, LR, and LM. We have to see overlays graph in parallel doing this. Go to Impulse tab. There's a new REW feature. When you right click here, you can replicate all SPL selections and whatever is selected here will be selected here automatically. This is quite useful when there are too many measurements. We want to calibrate everything to LM, the middle one, which is at zero, almost time zero, as you see. This is how accurately mic alignment tool can calibrate microphone position. By the way, you have to have all of them ticked. We opened overlays just to show you the moving of the impulse peaks when I cross correlation align them. In fact, you do all this from on the SPL screen. You select all the ones that you're gonna align to each other. The one at the top here, not the selected one. We want to time align everything to the middle measurement. I thought this was just being selected and it would be enough, but no, it prioritizes the one at the top of this list. So you have to move LM to the top and then cross correlation align. Now LM will stay where it is and every other impulse, every other measurement will move on top of it because it's nearby measurements. Normally they can move elsewhere. It's just cross correlating them and finding out the highest cross correlation time alignment. Cross correlation align and they are all aligned. Click it a couple of more times until they stop moving completely. I don't know if you can see it on your screens, but they were still moving. Now they don't. Now speaker L is aligned. We don't have to align R's because speaker R is my acoustic timing reference. They will already be on time zero automatically. You can even see that toggle selections, untick LR's. And as you see, all of the right speaker measurements are on top of each other. So now that speakers are time aligned properly, we can create the actual speaker measurement that we are going to base all our corrections on. With all the L selected, create one more copy of LM. Controls, measurement actions, LM selected, response copy. You give more weighted average to middle measurement. Then take a vector average of all these four in the screen. Two LMs, LL and LR. Vector average. 
and call this L0. This is our left speaker response. One more thing to illustrate before going forward. My LM measurement, for example. If you take psychoacoustic smoothing of these three, you will see that up until the room transition frequency around 200 Hz, they are almost the same. But in the high frequencies, the differences are quite obvious. That's why you don't equalize for high frequencies as much as you do with the low frequencies. However, in my response, there is a difference even at 50 Hz. That's because of my electricity hum. I think these are its harmonics at 150, 200, 250. It goes all the way until 800. I don't know how to get rid of it. Someone in the block is using something terrible and it affects my electric. This is the L0 response. Again, psychoacoustic. We didn't use any frequency dependent windowing or any kind of smoothing so far. You must have wondered why. But if you take frequency dependent windowing of all these, for example, apply all, you will see that our average is already right in the middle of them but i should stop explaining why i do what i do and just describe the process because already 10 minutes in and i couldn't even create the first filter yet you can ask any procedures you don't understand later in the comments section i try to respond to comments quite quickly so revert all these no smoothing so we can continue from where we were left this is L0, now we have to switch to R0, toggle selections, antic LR, LRC, and LM copy obviously, RL, RR, and RM, and we have to make one copy of RM, response copy, so we have four measurements on the screen, and vector average, and this is our R0. Now we can get rid of RM copy, LM copy, LRC, LRM, RM, RR, LR, all of them, except for L0 and R0, because it's gonna be quite crowded here later on. We can have one LR0 vector average for comparison purposes at the end of the correction. We won't use it in calculations. We will instead use Something here is not smoothed. Yeah. L and R ticked. We take an RMS average. We will use this one for determining the target curve. Close the waterfalls. Target settings. 200 hertz. 200 hertz. 0 0.7. 0 0.7. This can be 10. All we want is a straight line here with this slope. This is ideal for 75 dB and around measurements. It's very similar to Harman target curve, just straight instead of a curve here. And in fact, it's not even a straight line. This is logarithmic axis. If you switch to linear axis, you will see that it's actually a curved target. So don't humiliate this straight line. It works very well. Calculate target from response. No target type, and it doesn't change the level we are after anyway. And generate measurement from target shape. Down with EQ. We can also get rid of the RMS average and call this just target. Now we have the left and right speaker, proper measurements, average of three measurements in fact, and a target curve, a common target curve for both left and right speaker. Now we can start creating the first filter. As you know, bass waves have long wavelengths and they bounce back and forth from the walls of the room, creating peaks and dips in the frequency response. These frequencies are called room modes. Although side walls and floor and ceiling also produce these modes, the strongest of these waves form in the longest axis of a room, which is typically between the front and rear walls. The time it takes for the first such wave to travel from your speaker to the rear wall, bounce and travel back to the front wall and bounce and arrive back to the speaker, is double the room length divided by the speed of sound. This is independent of where your speaker or your seat is placed, hence the name standing wave. A physical solution to the standing waves problem, called double bass array, which consists of two or more identical subwoofers placed at opposite walls of a room firing at each other with carefully calibrated delays to cancel out these waves is quite common and successfully implemented. It's possible to design something similar in the digital domain. Since we don't have extra sets of subwoofers, we need to produce a counter wave from the same speaker at just the right time with opposite phase to cancel out the standing wave. 
This is the idea behind the virtual base array filter. As I explained, the first peak frequency is dependent on the room length, which can easily be calculated by dividing two times the room length with the speed of sound, which will give you the period of a wave, and when you invert the wave's period, you get its frequency in one over second units, also called hertz. Since the room length doesn't change in time, these peaks will keep repeating at the same intervals, only fading in strength by the absorption of the room. Now I have optimized and standardized digital base array filters to make the process straightforward. Here's an Excel file. Here you enter your room's length, give or take 5 meter 35 centimeters in my case, and it calculates the expected peak frequencies. Very easy calculation. The first peak frequency is expected to be at 32 hertz. The calculation is, in fact, double the room length divided by the speed of sound, 343 meters per second, and then one divided by this result to convert it to frequency. So it directly divides the double room length here by the speed of sound and calculates the first frequency. The second frequency is exactly double the first frequency, so it's very simple. And the third one is exactly triple the first peak frequency. So these are your expected peak frequencies. Between these peak frequencies, at exactly the middle of them, there are the dips also caused by the cancellations of the standing waves. And these are really easy to calculate as well. It's one and a half times the first peak frequency, the first one. And the second one is two and a half times the first peak frequency, because it's between second and the third peak. Once you have this information, it's much easier to spot the actual observed frequency peaks and dips in your measurement. Let's open some space for as much as possible. So with my left speaker, go to SPL and phase. From logarithmic, switch to linear axis so that you can see the equal interval repeating peaks and dips easier. Now, the first expected peak is at 32. Where is my first peak? It's at... 34.1 there is nothing closer to 32 around so you pick that one 34.1 now the second peak expected around 64 hertz 64 is here and it's probably this one because there is nothing closer to 64 around here not this one this one is 72 this one is 56 so it's got to be 63 Enter for the second observed peak, 63. The third one should be around 96 here. And there is nothing here, but this is the closest. Find the exact peaks here in a larger resolution, if you can. And that is 92.70. Now the observed dips. The first one is expected to be at 48. Let's check this one. The deepest dip I have. And it's 52.4. How about this one? 46.9. So this one is closer to 48, hence you have to pick this one, 46.9. This is how useful this kind of calculation is. You don't even confuse which one of the dips you will take into consideration. The second dip, final dip, is expected at 80 hertz. This dip here is a very good candidate and it's 83.40. Yes, we take that one. I don't even calculate the third dip because it automatically calculated our first peak frequency for the row, optimized. How it comes to that 30.85 hertz instead of 34, it's very easy. Finds the average of the first three peaks, dividing the second one by two, the third one by three, and averaging them here. These are the peak averages and the dips by the same token dividing the second one by two and then averaging these two. So my peak frequency average is 32.16, dip frequency average is 44.30. This is supposed to be one and a half times the first peak. So here what it does is divide this by one and a half and add by this one and divide into two. So averaging dips and peaks here, coming to 30.85 Hertz and then calculating its period is very straightforward. Just invert it. This is in seconds, so multiply it by 1000. Here it's doing it directly, 1000 divided by the frequency gives you in milliseconds the expected impulse speed of the standing wave, which is 32.4149 milliseconds. And the crossover frequency, although you only measure the three peaks and two dips, it goes to the third dip, also works on that area, which is actually between the third and the fourth peaks. So it's three and a half times the first peak. That's how it calculates the crossover frequency. 
the filter is in fact effective all the way to three peaks and three dips covers all of the sub base and some of the base area like until here something effectively gets it off all the standing waves largest standing waves with a very clean filter i will explain why using this as a pre-filter is an optimization in every way now we have the calculations ready we have to create a digital filter we need a low pass filter to stop applying this virtual base array after 108 hertz so we go to eq filters okay first when we don't have any filter we generate measurement from filters that will create our direct pulse that's the perfect impulse response which we'll have to use to create the filter Rev even takes a note here result is a pure impulse you can see that its frequency response is zero all the way and its phase response is also zero degrees all the way its impulse response however is a sharp peak at time zero with 100% strength and nothing anywhere else so this is the perfect impulse called the direct impulse quite useful with filter design now we have the impulse response again go to eq this time the last two filters are crossover filters symbolized by x you pick low pass filter butterworth is fine and the cutoff frequency should be 108 and the roll-off should be as steep as possible 48 db per octave so the filter is applied as long as it can be applied up until the cutoff frequency 108 here and then rolls off very steeply so that it doesn't affect anything beyond now generate measurement from filters again and this one is our led speaker low pass filter lpf now you can see it in the spl tab you see this is the crossover filter this is the direct response and these are our responses let's untick r and lr now we have the filter but it needs to be causal so we create a minimum phase version of it with nothing ticked make minimum phase copy and now also we have to invert this polarity so it counteracts the standing wave inverting polarity is not the same as trace arithmetic one over a vector operation one over a vector operation is time reversing an impulse reverses the frequency response and the phase polarity only changes the phase as you see frequency response doesn't change now that we had the inverted minimum phase correctly crossed over filter we need to align its impulse peak go to impulse tab fit to data here is its impulse peak somewhere around six milliseconds let's zoom in and calculate better so the peak is somewhere here 7.34 back to excel what you do in fact it needs to be at 32.4149 milliseconds ours is at 7.3423 milliseconds 7.3423 so you have to shift it by 25.0726 milliseconds the formula is very simple just subtract the current peak from the ideal impulse peak and that's the offset you need to apply you go to offset t equals zero and enter the negative offset here minus 25.0726 press the tab key you have to shift it by 8.6 meters to counteract the standing waves perfectly not perfectly but in the optimized way so that it takes care of all the peaks and dips as good as possible okay now everything is ready to create the filter it's time aligned impulse peak is now at 32.141 exactly like in the excel file for 30.85 hertz first peak and the filter is created by adding it with the perfect impulse dirac plus the minimum phase version of the low pass filter addition generate here is the filter actually i forgot something 
one more optimization once you create this minimum phase version you also have to align its SPL give it a 6 dB SPL offset fixed number this is optimized the reason for that is actually coming from the Dirac if you check the info it has a beta offset of 3 dB 3.01 and the crossover filter also has 3 dB data offset so you just deduct it here as minus 6 the minimum phase has moved down 6 dB after that you can create the filter Dirac plus LLPFMP generate so as you see this is much smaller in amplitude than the first one we created this is the shape of the filter now let's see the effect of this filter on the response L0 multiplied by and first call this L L P no, this is L V B A or for our purposes this is L filter one because we are about to finish filter one so now L times L filter one vector multiplication convolving the filter with the actual sound there you go This is the target curve, actual response, and after the VBA filter. It's taking care of some dips here and here, and minimizing the peaks. The remaining peaks are from side walls or ceiling and floor. We leave to deal with them to our immerse filter. FIR filters are predominantly not very good in the sub base area, so this VBA filter. Although it's also FIR, it's helping us to very cleanly get rid of the first standing waves and make the immersion filters job much easier because this is much cleaner. I mean, if you look at this filter's step response, for example, where is it? Okay. It's like you couldn't even draw a better one with a the ruler. There is some, okay, we don't need that. This is the step response. And there is some pre and post ringing, as you see, but is this normalized? Yes. I mean, when it is too articulate, anything up to 20 is inaudible, and this is like less than five. Although it starts quite early at around 284 nanoseconds. So this is a very clean filter. Nothing can come close to that. And we call this one now. Finish with the first filter. This is L1. Now the second filter. Precise magnitude immersion filter. Easiest and the quickest to implement and the most useful. FIR filters are perfect for high frequencies without any degradation in sound unlike IRR filters. And the pre-VBA filter, virtual base array filter, helps this one excel in every way. Now select all. Fit to data. And this is the non-minimum phase version of the filter. Look at the noise of minimum phase version. Get rid of it completely. Now, let's leave just L1 on the screen and the target. We continue from L1. We already pre filtered this with the virtual base array. I'm not sure how, how much to zoom in the screen. Okay, zero is visible. That is still visible. Yes, and 20, 20,000. Maybe something like this okay no frequency dependent windowing trace arithmetic divide l1 with target this one here no regularization zero generate here it should be appearing in around 0 dB, yes. This ugly thing here is the division and then invert the division. So rather than dividing target by L1, we had to do it in two steps for reasons you don't need to know. And this time 8% regularization, which means we are going to be 
applying maximum 5 dB boost to dips. This is only related to the boost in the dips. Lower limit, upper limit unticked, so it applies to all the frequency band. Target level at auto and exclude notches ticked generate. So now this is zero. This is the one over A filter that we created by immersion. As you see, it's exactly the carbon copy of what is left on top of the target curve here from the response with all the detail that you can never match with an equalizer filter. Now, you have to check that target level here that automatically produced, that's 2.1. It will be different for your left and right speaker. You have to give this an offset to complete it to 3 dB. Okay, so measurement actions and 3 minus 2.1. So you have to increase it by 0 0.9 dB. This is important for the synchronization between left and right speakers. Add offset to data. Now we raise it up a little bit and create minimum phase version. We want causal filter. Make minimum phase copy, nothing ticked. So remember that. And that's it. We have already created our second filter. Let's call this one LF2. Now check how it works. L1 times LF2, vector multiplication, generate. Look at this baby and call this L2. L0, L1, L2, target, fit to data. This was our original response. This is the target and this is now the final response after two filters. Check how the dips are all gone and how accurately it imitates the target curve. Okay, down with the second filter. Now this third filter will be a phase correction filter with a unique method where we will simultaneously align for speaker crossover phase shifts and some low bass phase anomalies with some tricks to avoid any pre-echo or ringing. A phase filter will have no visible effects on the frequency response, but it's one of the most important filters. Passive speakers have analog crossover filters between their drivers i.e. between woofer and mid-range, mid-range and tweeter and what have you. Those filters have varying degree of orders depending on their capacitor and inductor counts. For example, a filter with two reactive components like one capacitor and one inductor is a second order filter or with one capacitor and two inductors is a third order filter, so on and so forth. You can usually find your speaker's crossover frequencies as well as their filter orders in their tech specs. For each order of the filter, the passive crossover causes a 6 dB per octave roll-off and the corresponding phase shift, which causes timing differences between drivers. With the rephase linearization tools, we can compensate for these phase shifts. This will not only increase the level of first attack of the overall impulse, but also improve the center sound stage. For example, if the direct sound is in phase between mid-range and Twitter, the localization will be at Twitter height, so you will be lifting your center stage higher, which in my opinion is one of the features that distinguishes an excellent system from a good system. Good systems have central sound image, phantom image, that's called. Excellent systems have height in their central image. To create this filter properly, you will need at least the higher frequency crossover information for your speaker. For my three-way counter twos, this is at 2700 Hz, fourth order, which will require 24 per octave linearization. We will use L2, the final response, after two filters on my left speaker. Let's create a copy of that first to keep this one intact. Response copy L2. Now we have to align L2's impulse peak with the original L0 measurement because throughout the vector operations here, the impulse peak must have shifted a little bit. We want them time aligned with the original measurement. So we go to overlays. L2, L0 and L2 copy. As you see, L2 has shifted a little bit to the left compared to L0, which is a peak is at time zero. <coughs> you can do that by measuring the difference and giving it a time offset of 0.2 centimeters or you can use cross correlation align or time align but we have to keep l0 intact so select l0 and l2 copy here nothing else ticked and select l0 and l0 should be on top of l2 copy to be 
taken as the reference measurement and now do a cross correlation align now it's quite slow you have to do it a couple of times until it fits perfectly this could be a bug i'm not sure yet but eventually it always aligns so i'm not too concerned when it stops moving you're looking at here i hope okay now it's aligned after we align it now we will apply to this l2 copy on the screen frequency dependent windowing of one cycle As you see this is like starting from 35 cycles which is almost exactly like the measurement itself in resolution when you go down to one the smallest cycle value it becomes a straight line so this is one trick to be able to properly align crossover phase shifts and some other low base correction now once you do that you export this l2 copy measurement file export measurement as text as it is with the default settings use range of measurement resolution of measurement smoothing of measurement to some folder call this l2 open it with three phase measurement import from file l2 and here we have our l2 response now in the face this is part of the magnitude response which we don't need to see but if you want you just arrange the ranges here like amplitude is from minus that's why we can't see all of it so make it zero starts from zero goes to 100 db and this will bring the magnitude response which we don't really need to see we will only be dealing with the face so hide magnitude now this is the phase response very much smoothed with ftw of one cycle first adjust the timing offset which is basically bringing this right hand tip of the phase response to time zero which is here this is time zero because this is the highest frequency we measured it arrives the first we should accept it as time zero minus 18 keeps it a little bit over and then with keyboard keys in any box in the phase you can change the numbers which is quite practical and it's the only way to properly optimize the adjustments but it has certain steps that it jumps and neither minus 18 nor minus 19 is perfect so you go now type minus 18.5 and delete and 4 okay delete and 3 delete and 2 3 4 5 so it's something like 35 it doesn't need to be very accurate so visually now we have the highest frequency at time zero then we go to filters linearization tab and i know my speakers highest crossover frequency is 2700 if you have crossovers above 2000 this is where you have to enter automatically here without checking the response because you don't want to deal with anything above 2000 in phase correction it's fourth order four times six 24 db per octave roll off which kind of brought this part of the phase response to time zero without this as you can see there is a discontinuity in the phase here at this area and there is one here and these are delays this is in two-dimensional axis that we are seeing the phase but in fact it's a rotating in 3d thing this phase and this is it's two dimensional and when it has this continuities like that like from here to here from a 106 ish hertz to 2000 hertz it has completed one rotation 360 degree rotation one wavelength so it's a time delay and it depends on the frequencies that this is happening in between this is quite a lot of delay between this frequency and this base frequency here in the speaker so this should be compensated because of the crossover this phase shift is here okay you can check also and see that it is 2889 something this is where you have to read unfortunately reface doesn't have a very nice user interface but it's a very useful program nonetheless i know mine is 2700 so i directly enter this i could have fixed that giving a linear filtrization at around 2880 but it would be wrong 
and the measurements are nowhere near accurate enough no matter what you do to change 2700 phase just enter here for example i know my second crossover between the woofer and the mid-range is at 260 hertz it's a second order filter so it should be 12 db per octave i could think that my crossover phase shift is fixed but by using a trick where i find the discontinuity it's at 115 hertz Instead of that, I use 115 and I try 12 first. It's 115 here. It's not on zero yet. So I try 24. And now it's around zero. But again, by keyboard, move it back and forth. 120, between 120 and 110 somewhere. So you type 115 and then try 4, 3, 6, 7, 6. 0.5 seems to be the correct shift that you should apply so now by using the crossover phase linearization tool we are actually fixing the phase response up to 20 hertz by the way here the ranges you should automatically choose from 20 hertz to 24,000 hertz so this is what we are interested at you can do not much for lower frequencies anyways even with a lot of type of fear filters and it's quite dangerous area to play with so now that is what you have to fix it is very smooth and only only in this resolution you can do something about the phase this is where you switch to paragraphic phase equalizer now the lower frequency the more dangerous it is to play with for ringing here you have a ballpark figure of where the frequency dip is i think it's something like 57.9 so I start with that. A Q of maximum one at the lowest frequency we will fix. It should even be lower than one. And the phase change should not be more than 45 degrees. Better change the range from 90 to 45. So when you move those sliders, it will not change more than 45 degrees. As you can see somewhere here at one, it's flat at zero. Let's leave it like that for the time being. And this should never be above 1 and this should never be above 45 and if this is 40 and this is 1 it is still dangerous the two combines and it creates ringing very important especially in the lowest frequencies below 100 anything up to 500 has potential to cause ringing so you should be careful above 500 you can use whatever you want but in this form and shape of the phase response you don't really need tight Q values. By the way, the Q affects a wider area, the lower it is. For example, now at 1, that's the problem with fixing this, because if I want to use lower Q, it will affect the whole frequency range. So it will affect everywhere else. When I'm fixing this, I will be ruining this part. I can show you the effect. I'm now lowering the Q by keyboard. As you see, it's lifting up everything else with it. The higher it is, the more local its effect is. Now it lifted only this part. From here to here, it gave a rise of 27 degrees with what 7.8 Q. But when the Q goes down, it starts lifting up every other frequency band. And then now it's lifting here and now it's lifting even here at 10,000 Hertz at 0 0.2. However, 0 0.2, for example, is certain that will not cause ringing. Okay, the higher this goes, the more ringing potential you will have. As a rule of thumb, when you keep this at or below 1 and this below 45, you'll be safe. Especially if the frequency is higher. So with that out of the way, let's continue fixing this curve. So now the second lowest frequency is here, still below 500. It seems something like 280. So let's try that. 280 with 1Q. Let's see what we can do okay kind of here when you lower this you want to equalize the peak and the dip here and here so it should be in the middle what you do is optimize the frequency by keyboard going back and forth until the heights of these peaks for example here are equal something between this and this one which is 330 and 330 so 325 26 27 okay 26 i see this part and this part exactly equal here so i'm gonna go with this and now bring it back to zero 
try some lowering of the Q so it affects a larger area while also minimizing the total like between this dip and the highest peak this difference minimal so you're flattening the whole thing with as little effort and lowest Q as possible so it's a bit of a tricky work here but the only way that can be done properly so you might end up something like this so equal deep and peak here and then go back to your 57.9 hertz and raise it a bit more until this and this equalizes okay and now here is this bump here which it seems to be at 1040 hertz this is very easy 1040 you can use whatever q you like here although you will not need a longer one but let's try five and take it down when it's at zero now optimize five bring it lower until it affects a wider area and makes it as flat as possible so back and forth you make the optimization like this and this is the best place now it's almost flat but you can do still more one way to even get better here is to change the ranges for example to 20 minus 20 to plus 20 so it's now even more accurate and we see more bumps so what else can be done for here we can optimize this a little bit better 0 0.8 0 0.7 0 0.6 0 0.0 but it doesn't change much 58 59 60 61 61 so 2 3 4 3 look i'm trying to make it flat here so 63 is that and 62 63 64 so it should be 63 and a half something 4 6 7 8 7 now it's flat and we are looking at 20 to 20 so this is quite high resolution now we can bring it again to zero like this keeping the bottom and the dip equal now we have to play back with this one which is no longer let's check if the frequency is optimized yeah keeping them equal the minimum distance here and then readjust this one Again, the frequency needs to be optimized. There is a slope now here again. You need to make it flat. Yeah. And this one. So you can do this as long as you want in this resolution. So now 605 Hertz, we need a filter phase, paragraphic phase equalizer. 605. Let's save it because it's over 500 we are safe okay even five is too much now optimize the queue now optimize the frequency it's 645 yeah look here and here it's not equal now I can further optimize the queue, something like that, and then rise it up so that this and this is equal. Now we need a little bit more adjustment here again. Yeah, and a little bit more here. From time to time, you should order by ascending frequency and then order active EQ points first. So you have all the frequencies lined up here in order. Whenever you want to fix some place, you have to check if you have already some filter at that frequency. If not, you can create a new one. For example, here now we have to play a little bit. This is around 500. We have this 645 here. Yeah, this is how it should be here and here. Okay, you can still fix these because now, although it's 277 hertz or here, 161 hertz, okay, one which we haven't done, 161. The Q should be higher than 1, but the phase change degree is going to be so small, as you see, it is only here 1.2 degrees. 
So with 1.2 degree adjustment, it doesn't really matter how high the Q is. So let's do this. Okay, 2 is affecting everywhere else, so let's increase it a little bit to 3. Still don't go too high. Let's see. I think we can live with this. Maybe a frequency optimization here, 160, 59, 58, 57, 56, oh, 9, 62, 60. Yeah, not much we can do really. And now this one, finally, taking all the time, as you see, 274, 274. Again, something like three is gonna be. Oops, and only one point four degrees of change. Now we have to redo this one, and finally something here maybe ninety four. At ninety four, we should be careful for the Q value. No more than two probably only because i'm only doing one degree of change otherwise this should be below one and if you the original filter and again order by ascending frequency and activate those first now this and then the next one can be this and then here something is going on 500 ish well we might need two filters here and here they are high frequency so it's safe but I'm not going to lose any more video time on this. You got the idea. It should be a very smooth adjustment, low Q values and not very harsh. Like the most dangerous one we use here is this first one, as usual. We could try to even lower this to 0 0.8 would be safer and then enforce higher degree correction in this area could be safer. But this is not going to be causing ringing, but it's going to be at the limit of it. Once you have that, done for the left speaker go for 131072 taps because rev is using this amount actually it's using 262144 taps for each filter we created there just for the sake of similarity in between i think 48000 hertz you have to pick 32 bits and this is the most accurate the two is i triple e stereo of uh, mono sorry it should be I mean, mono and choose the folder and call this lf3 which not only fixed our crossover phase shifts but also for example i could have changed my crossover to 160 and it would be fixing this area but we also did something for this area up to almost 50 hertz which is good enough without causing ringing and this is a pre-filter for phase. The other phase filter is the fourth filter, the next step. Now you created the wave file. You better save this before you exit because you might need to come back if there is any ringing. Okay, what I want. Now to export this into REW, all you have to do is drop this produce wave file onto REW and here it comes. There will be an SPL offset, random SPL offset in the response for imports in REW. This one came with 117 dB. So you have to take off this as SPL offset minus 117. And when I click tab key, you will see the response at zero dB here. Right now it's at 117. That's why you can see it on the screen. And here it comes. This has no importance on the correction. You could use this filter at 200 dB SPL. The impulse response doesn't have SPL information. It would still work, but then you wouldn't be able to see your correction results on screen because the moment you convolve this with your measurement, the result will be produced somewhere around 120 Hertz. It wouldn't be on your screen. Just for visual purposes, it's good to align this to zero and everything else. So now this is our phase filter. I'll show you the effect of it. L2 
L2 is still intact in terms of frequency dependent windowing, right? Yes, it's okay, it's the same. The L2 copy is badly <laughs> underrated, I can say. Okay, trace arithmetic, convolving the third filter to the second result, LF3, A times B vector multiplication. And here comes our L3, which, as you can see, is a carbon copy of L2 in the frequency domain. The target, they are exactly the same. Like nothing changed. In fact, a lot of things changed. Now we go to overlays, new rare future, copy selection to other overlay graphs. So when you open overlays, you will have these two only in every tab. Here are the impulse responses of L2 and L3. In comparison, look at L3 impulse response, how much better it is than L2. Most of the reflections here, here are gone just by a very little phase correction done at uh, frequency dependent windowing one cycle. Or go to step graph. Okay, the cost we pay is this is L0, this is L1 and L2. In the step response, this is time zero here. Okay, so anything before time zero is pre and anything after time zero is post. So any ringing here is post ringing and any ringing here is pre ringing. A linear phase filter will have pre and post ringing by definition. It's symmetric in the time zero. So without the L3, everything was kind of linear, no ringing ish. L1 caused almost no change on L0. This is the beauty of the VBA filter. Although it was dealing with the toughest of the lowest frequencies. If you remember, the lower the frequency, the harder it is to change the phase without causing ringing. And L2 also didn't, didn't change much because they're beautiful inversion filters, but it moved a little bit, as you see. And L3, despite fixing the step response, look at the L3 step response compared to others. All the wiggles here are gone. Here are done. It's the best so far by a margin compared to the others. I don't know if in these colors it's easy to spot, but the price we pay is this slope here. This is five milliseconds in the pre ringing area. Anything happens after five milliseconds is safe. Okay, this can go all the way here to, for example, 260 percent. These two should be ticked when you're checking this. Okay, but if it's happening after five milliseconds to time zero, it's safe. If it's happening before five milliseconds, your limit is 20% here. Even 10% would be safer. So something like this is just at the border of pure ringing. If any steeper like this, for example, or like that, these are major ringing causes. And this pure echo ringing thing, once you hear it, you can't unhear it. It's really strange, like a reverse sucking of the sound by the speaker. You'll understand what I'm saying. It's very hard to describe. We are now done with the third filter. This video is already over an hour long, so I have decided to split. For the fourth and the last filter, please click on the video link on your screen. Access phase inversion with Rumi Qzert. Bye for now.